Today is our last day with new content. We're going to look at what's called the simple harmonic oscillator model. It's modeling simple harmonic motion. If you've taken physics, you should know a little bit about simple harmonic motion. And you probably should have learned that it's modeled with trig functions, cosines and sines that oscillate in what you might say is an ideal way. What we want to do in calculus two here at the end of the semester is learn how to model this with differential equations. Not that you have to do it that way, because you could just hypothesize that the motion is cosines and sines. But if you model with differential equations, it has the benefit of allowing you to deal with more complicated situations. We are going to do it without any friction, but you could add friction. That makes it more complicated. You also could consider situations where you have oscillations, but actually trig functions like sine and cosine do not do the best possible job. I'm thinking in particular of a famous example called a pendulum, which is something that just swings back and forth like this. If you especially allow for it to go in completely around because there's no wall, there's no ceiling up here to stop it, and you give it a high enough initial velocity, it could go around the circle. For sure, that would not model back and forth motion that could be modeled with cosine and sine. So it's worthwhile to do the differential equations. So we want to imagine setting this up in such a way that we are minimizing friction. We're going to have a mass attached to a spring attached to a wall. So there's my wall, here's the spring, and here's the mass, a block of wood, say. To minimize friction, we'll imagine it's sitting on ice. And we will also imagine it's sitting inside a vacuum chamber to minimize our friction. Of course, you're never going to completely get a, uh, around having friction because there would always be at least friction inside the spring itself. Right, the molecules kind of like rubbing against each other. Is that really what happens? Well, no, if you get into it deeply enough with quantum mechanics, you realize atoms and molecules are not like billiard balls. They're more like fuzzy clouds of probability. And you might wonder, how can that possibly be? Don't worry about it, OK? Just saying that there's certainly internal friction with the spring. So you can never completely get away with um, get away with avoiding friction. How do you create a differential equation model? Just like before, you use Newton's second law, f equals ma. This is always a differential equation in disguise. A is the acceleration of the mass. It's the rate of change of the mass's position, the second derivative, in fact. Let's assume in this picture that the mass is at equilibrium right there. So that is position zero. This is left-right motion. We need to pick a positive direction for the axis, it's most natural to make the positive direction to the right. That'll be the plus x direction. So when the mass is to the right of zero, which is where it would be when it's at rest, the center of mass would be right there. When it's pulled to the right, x is positive. When it's, say, let go and then moves to the left and gets over here, then x becomes negative. And it will be a back and forth motion where x oscillates between positive and negative. And yeah, cosine or a sine, or maybe even the sum of cosine and sine might be the best kind of model to use for that motion. By definition, the acceleration is the rate of change of the velocity. And by definition, the velocity is the rate of change of the position. And therefore, the acceleration is also the second derivative of the position with respect to time. But that's only one side of this equation. This is the mass times acceleration part. What's the force? That has to come from some other law. It's called Hooke's law. Hooke's law. I think Hooke lived around the same time as Newton. Tells you the nature of the force. 
called the restoring force of the spring. Think intuitively with me here. If you pull this mass to the right, stretching the spring, the restoring force is going to be in the opposite direction, the negative direction, when x is positive. If you scrunch the spring toward the wall, made the mass go toward the wall so that x becomes negative, then the restoring force is rightward in the positive direction. So you have to be thinking about the direction. That means you also could think of this in terms of vectors. But for the sake of simplicity, I won't. I will talk about vectors today, but not right now. It's some negative constant times x itself. That's the nature of the force. k itself is a positive constant. So negative k is a negative constant. This is certainly a quantity that is negative, a force pointing in the leftward direction, if x itself is positive. If, the, if you're over here, so the spring has been stretched. And it's positive if x is negative, because you'd have a negative times a negative making a positive. So the force is in the positive rightward direction if the spring has been scrunched and the mass is over here where x is negative. Should it really be a linear function of x? Why not, for example, negative x times x cubed or something? The answer is, well, the first answer is this is simpler. The second answer is it works good enough if your oscillations are small. How small is small? It depends. Certainly, you could imagine x getting too big. If you grab the mass, pull it too far to the right, the spring could break. Maybe it just stops being springy, or maybe it completely breaks if you pull it too far too fast. And that, in theory, could happen if you scrunch the mass toward the wall too, too far. The spring could break. Still not a proof that this is the best model. In reality, you've got to test it against experiment. So the equality between negative kx and m times that second derivative is a differential equation. In fact, since it involves a second derivative of x, you'd call it a second order differential equation. First order differential equations only involve first derivatives of the dependent variable. Second order equations involve second derivatives. They could also involve first derivatives, but they don't have to. Being a second order equation actually means you need two initial conditions for initial value problems. And that should make sense if you think about the physical model. If you pull that mass to the right and let it go, say, from rest, technically the motion is going to be different than if you pull it to the right and hit it with a hammer, giving it some non-zero initial velocity. That'll be a different motion with for sure a different amplitude. And you might wonder maybe even a different frequency or something. Well, that's not, that's not so clear. We might have to see what the model predicts. So we need two initial conditions. One for the initial position, one for the initial velocity. X naught could represent your arbitrary initial position, that is going to be x of zero. That's the initial position. It could be positive or negative. V naught could be our name for the initial velocity. It's x prime of zero. The derivative of x with respect to t plug in time equals zero. That's the initial velocity. That also can be positive or negative initial velocity. If I pull the mass to the right and hit it with hammer like this, watch my hand, like that, then the initial velocity will be negative because it will be in the leftward direction. On the other hand, if I hit it like a hammer this way, then the initial velocity would be, would be positive. How many solutions do this, does this have and what are they? It's got infinitely many solutions. 
there's infinitely many possible motions. You might also argue there's infinitely many possible initial conditions. So there's infinitely many answers. A general solution of this turns out to be what's called the linear combination of cosines and sines. Some constant times a cosine plus another constant times a sine. Let me just write down one solution. X equals cosine of something times T will turn out to be a solution if I pick the, sum, the something in front of the T appropriately. And we will check if you pick the something in front of the T to be square root of K over M, this will work. This is a solution. You should be able to check this. What's M times the second derivative? This side of the differential equation for this function. I've got to find its second derivative, which means I need to find its first derivative first. The second derivative is going to be the derivative of the first derivative. Differentiate this. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. You keep this the same inside the parentheses here, square root of k over m times t. Then the chain rule gives you an extra factor of negative of square root of k over m. That's the first derivative, and I'm taking the derivative of that, ultimately giving me the second derivative to match this. So differentiate again. The derivative of negative sine is negative cosine. The input is still the same, square root of k over m times t. But then the chain rule gives me an extra factor of square root of k over m. So I have two factors of square root of k over m which means the square root goes away. The m's cancel. The k can be brought out in front. This is negative k times cosine of square root of k over m times t. But this thing right here is just x as a function of time. So this all simplifies to negative k times x which is the other side of the differential equation right there. These equalities that you see here are true for all t. Here, 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 here. Those are true no matter what t is. Sometimes you don't see the t explicitly in there, like right there, there's no t. You need to realize that it's understood that x is a function of time. That's traditional. We're not going to buck tradition. It's understood. By the way, sometimes this initial condition is written as d of zero or dx dt evaluated at zero would be a few different ways to do write that. There's actually one more way that I'll inform you about as well. Sometimes, especially in more advanced physics classes like mechanics, they might write this as x dot of zero. The dot above the x there represents a derivative with respect to t. It's just a little faster to write than these things. Well, I guess that's fast to write as well, but, and that's fast too, but uh, it's faster than the Leibniz notation. What initial conditions does this satisfy? When you plug in zero, you get cosine of zero, which is one. So the initial position would be one meter if you're using SI units. And the initial velocity, B of zero or X prime of zero would be negative sine zero times square root of K over M, but sine of zero is zero. So this becomes zero. <clears throat> So this particular, this particular function right here is a solution and it models a mass on a spring when it has been stretched one meter from equilibrium and let go from rest. Okay, it, it's a big spring. One meter, you know, is like that, that long or whatever. 
<laughs> Can I clarify anything here? This is our last main model. I do want you to be able to understand this for the final exam. In the video that I made, I did ask a question with more in it. I said the mass has five kilograms. That's right there at the top. I gave them, at least when I gave this particular problem, the value K explicitly. But I'm going to tell you that you should be able to figure out K if I give you other information. Like what? K is called the spring constant. That's what K is called. If K is really large, it's a very, you might say, thick spring, very stiff. If K is real small, close to zero, then it's a very loose spring, maybe like a slinky or something. You should be able to figure out K using the fact that the magnitude of the force, magnitude of the force called the restoring force, by magnitude, I mean its size, its absolute value, is this thing in absolute value. And that can be written as K times the absolute value of X. And if I told you that it takes, say, 10 newtons of force to stretch that spring by, say, half a meter, you should be able to figure out k from that. Just use this equation. Replace the magnitude of f by 10 newtons. Replace the absolute value of x by 0.5 meters. Divide both sides by 0.5. In that case, if the force again is 10 newtons and the absolute value of x is 0.5 meters, that's going to imply that k is 10 divided by 0.5, which is 20 newtons per meter. Okay, in that problem in the video, I didn't give that kind of information. I just told them straight away what K was. But I'm telling you right now, you should be able to figure out K if I tell you how much force it takes to stretch the spring by a certain amount. Make sense? Just divide both sides by the absolute value of X. Having a formula is certainly helpful. You can measure M and K. And based on those measurements, you can make a prediction for this being the formula for the position as a function of time if these are your initial conditions. And that would tell you, for example, what the period of the motion is. How long does it take to come back to where it started, for example? That's one period. The answer would be, you know from pre-calculus, take 2 pi divided by that coefficient. The period, if I asked you for that, 2 pi divided by square root of k over m. That's a k there. I can't quite tell. That is the same as 2 pi times the, squ times the square root of m over k. And that's got practical consequences. For example, if the mass is really tiny, very small block of wood, and the spring is very stiff, M is small and K is large, the period is going to be very small. A small period means very slow motion, right? It takes a long, oh, excuse me. A small period is very fast motion. It takes a short amount of time to get back to where it started. On the flip side, if it's a very big mass and a very small K, like a slinky, Then this is a large period. That's a slow motion. Could a slinky actually pull a mass? Well, technically, if there was no friction, it should be able to. If you were doing it on a rug, there'd probably be too much friction for it to do anything. OK. 
So I want you to be able to do this for the exam. This is our last main model. I also want you to be able to do what I'm about to show you. I want you to be able to convert that second order equation to a first order system. Convert to a first order system of differential equations. Why is that a good idea and how can it be done? What in the world am I talking about? My goal is to write down a system of two first order differential equations and only involving first derivatives because that has the benefit, just like with the worms and the robins and the predator prey model, of allowing me to make a phase plane in which I can sketch solutions and try to interpret them as parametric curves in that plane. And that has the benefit, if necessary, for more complicated situations of just using technology to see what solutions look like without doing much work, including possibly using some higher dimensional version of Euler's method for numerical approximation. Those are the reasons why this conversion to a first order system is a worthwhile thing to be able to do. What is the first order system? I've only got a single second order differential equation right here. For a first order system, I need two differential equations. The first of those two ends up being just the definition of what velocity is. Velocity is the derivative of the position by definition. Nothing magical going on there, nothing really fancy. That's just what velocity is rate of change of position. And it, yes, it can be positive or negative. If the mass is moving to the right, that's a positive velocity. If it's moving to the left, that's a negative velocity. The second differential equation, since this equation involves the velocity, must involve the derivative of the velocity, the acceleration. Hey. That's the equality between these two things after dividing both sides by m. So just take the equality between this expression and this one after you've divided by m, and that's your differential equation for the velocity. Negative k over m times x. Let's make it a little easier on ourselves by taking particular numbers for k and m. Let's say K is one Newton per meter and M is one kilogram. Just to make it simpler looking, dx dt is V and dv dt then becomes negative X. This is a system of first order differential equations, just like the worms and robins predator prey model for Monday, except it's simpler actually, right? These right-hand sides are simpler expressions. They're even linear in V and X, whereas with the worms and robins, we had nonlinear terms W times R. What we wanna do is we wanna draw a phase plane. With the worms and robins, the axes were labeled with W and R. Here with this system, it makes sense to label the axes with X and V. Before we try to draw in a solution curve, it's a good idea to draw those null clines. With the worms and robins, worms was the horizontal axis and the worm null cline consisted of two lines. One that was the R axis when W is zero, no worms. Another one, if you remember from Monday, was actually a horizontal line. And we had to cross that horizontal line with tangents that are vertical because 
dw dt was zero at along that horizontal line. The instantaneous rate of change of the worm population with respect to time was zero. Something similar happens here, except it's even simpler than the worms and robins. The x null decline is when dx dt is zero. But the differential equation is saying that's always equal to the v coordinate of the point you're at. This is equivalent to saying v is zero using this first differential equation. And where is v zero? Along the x axis. The x axis consists of all points where v is zero, right? v is positive up here, negative there. It's zero along the x axis. That's an, uh, the x null line, just that one line. And since it's an x null line where dx dt is zero, you've got to cross it with vertical tangents. In theory, you could cross, say, with straight lines going directly upward or directly downward. Then x is not changing at all in time. Now, of course, a mass moving on a spring x the position is going to change so that's not going to happen in theory it could go like this watch my pen i'm not going to draw it but it could go like this or in theory it could go like this it's that last way that happens although it's actually with the with the opposite direction it goes like this the vino line. is where the rate of change of v with respect to time is zero. dv dt is zero. Since dv dt is always the opposite of the x coordinate, that's the same as negative x being zero. Multiply both sides of that by negative one, that's the same as x itself being zero, which is the v-axis. The v-axis, all these points going up and down are where x is zero. The instantaneous rate of change of v with respect to t is zero along there. And that means solutions have to cross that horizontally. Where distinct noclines, x noclines and v noclines cross, you have equilibrium points. That's only at the origin here. That's your equilibrium point. It's a point that stays where it is for all time. Is that like a horizontal line in a slope field? Kind of. Like I said on Monday, you could imagine adding a third axis, a t-axis, say coming straight up out of your paper there. And then this dot would just get continued along that axis and you'd graph it as a straight line effectively. But since we're only imagining t, we just draw it as a dot. There's nothing wrong with calling it an equilibrium solution instead of equilibrium point. But as a, a single point at the origin, we can also call it an equilibrium point. In the case where k and m are, are one, solutions do turn out to be circles centered at the origin. And the motion is clockwise, not counterclockwise like we usually encounter. Draw arrows that are going clockwise here. Different initial conditions lead to different solution curves. Which one's correct? Again, it depends on your initial conditions. And again, technically, you can never get rid of friction. So technically, none of these is exactly right. But if the friction is really, really tiny, these will be approximately right for a certain finite amount of time at least. Our initial condition for this function here was that x of zero is one and v of zero is zero. I could use those same initial conditions and say that, for example, if this point right here on the x-axis is one, then I'm at this point when t is zero. The curve goes clockwise and comes back to where it started after how many units of time? 
if I'm using this with k and m equal to one, how long would it take to get back to where you started? Go ahead. Two pi, yeah. Two pi units of time. About 6.28 seconds. That's a fairly slow oscillation, right? If k and m are both, both one, that's a pretty slow oscillation. It would get faster, more realistic for that given spring um, by making the mass smaller. Or if you stayed with the same mass, make it a stiffer spring. Solution, or so I should say solution, solutions are parametric curves. Like what? If we use the exact same function we had here, taking k and m to be one, we would just get cosine of t for x. What about v? v would just be the derivative of cosine of t, negative sine of t. Here's an example. x comma v, which you could also write as x of t comma v of t, because x and v do depend on time, cosine of t comma negative sine of t. I'm getting that from here, taking k and m to be one, so x is cosine of t. Then I'm differentiating cosine of t to get negative sine of t, and that'll be the velocity. It's a parametric curve. That's going to be graphed like this. Let's let's graph it quick on a calculator. You would want to be in parametric mode, not function mode. On TI 84, that means in the menu, the mode menu, I go down to function and then highlight par for parametric. And then if I go to my y equals screen, screen, it looks a little different than usual. X and y are supposed to both depend on t. X is cosine of t, y is negative sine t. Negative sine t. Let t go from say zero to two pi. And we'd want to zoom in closer to the origin here, maybe negative two to two. And then graph it and you will see the solution curve. Ready? Notice that it will be traced out clockwise, not counterclockwise. Here it is. Looks more like an oval. An ellipse, that's only because the scales on the axes are different. We could do a zoom square, I think. Yeah, Z square to make the scales the same, and then it would look more like a circle. This model is predicting that the period only depends on K and M, at least if you found a general solution not on the initial conditions. So even if you stretch the spring further or gave it a really large initial velocity as long as it didn't break when you do so, <coughs> it's predicting the period, the back and forth amount of time to be the same no matter what the initial condition is. That might be a little bit unexpected, but that's the prediction. You got to test it against reality. That's the kind of test you'd want to do to see if the model is really accurate or not. It is accurate for masses on springs with fairly small oscillations so that the, mat, the uh, spring does not break. It's pretty good for pendulum going back and forth like this, as long as the oscillation is small. But if you allow the oscillation to get large and even go around the horn here because it's not touching the ceiling, then trig functions no longer work very well as, a pro even, as even approximate solutions. 
actually they technically don't work exactly right even for small oscillations. They're just good approximations though. How can I bring vectors into play? So there's a few different standard ways. I could like do like what we did with Lissajou figures back in February. I could draw in position and velocity vectors for this curve. For example, at a certain moment in time, the position vector might look like this, go from the origin out to the curve, say right like that. That point has coordinates x of t comma v of t. And we would say this position vector has the same functions as its components. x of t times i hat plus v of t times j hat. I'm not talking about vectors in the in the original picture, by the way. It's an arrow for this picture, not the not the original situation. Any vectors that I draw in this picture would have to go straight left or straight right. Because I'm not pulling this mass up off the ice. It's sliding on the ice back and forth. But in this picture, I could ignore the application and just think about the differential equations in the picture, not thinking at all about the application. Of course, you'd want to think about the application if you're trying to apply it. But if you just want to think about the math, you don't have to think about the application. You could think about this position vector for this point that moves as the point moves. So this arrow is going to rotate clockwise. I could also draw a velocity vector. And the velocity vector, as we saw with listed drew figures, is going to be tangent to the curve. It might look about like that. And it's always going to be tangent to the curve. What are its components? Its components are going to be the derivatives of the components of the original thing here. x prime of t times i hat plus v prime of t times j hat, which you could write as if you want, v of t times i hat plus a of t times j hat, where a is the acceleration as a scalar quantity. You could do that. You don't have to, but you could. You also could do one other thing. Because of your system of differential equations that's being followed here, yeah, you could replace dx dt with v, we already did that. But you also can replace a of t, which is dv dt, with negative x, because this satisfies the differential equation. You could replace a of t in this situation with negative x of t in this situation. Not in general, but in this model. The acceleration is in the opposite direction as the position. And in fact, when k and m are one, it equals the opposite of the position. We should take the time to double check that this solves the system. The system. Does dx dt, for example, always equal v? dx dt is the derivative of cosine of t, which we know is negative sine of t. And hey, yeah, that's the same as v of t. Because v is negative sine of t. And dv dt is the derivative with respect to time of v, which is negative sine t. And that's negative cos t which is the opposite of the position, just like it should be. And these are true for all t. Even though you don't see t's explicitly there, they're in your mind. 
They should be in your mind. So this checks that this is a solution of this system of differential equations. Some things in math are just almost too easy that they're confusing. I'm serious. This is an example. Like this is like too easy. It's confusing. Did I really do it right? Is that all I really have to do? Yeah, for these functions, that's x, that's v. It is the case that dx dt is v and dv dt is negative x. That is true. And that means that function satisfies the system of differential equations. It's almost too easy. And it makes you feel like you're you're not quite sure you did it right, did it right. How is this related to the phase plane, though? How is, how is this kind of thing related to the phase plane? That's where the idea of a vector field comes into play. <clears throat> We've used vector plot before. When we used it before, we used it to make slope fields. And we had things like perhaps one comma f of y in here to make a slope field for a first order differential equation. That's not what I'm doing here. Instead, I am <clears throat> plugging in the functions, you might call them, from the right-hand side of the differential equation the system v and negative x that's what i had there first v comma negative x x and v go both between negative three and three now by putting x first i am making effectively x the horizontal axis and putting v second i'm making v the vertical axis and what will we see we see a pretty plot like this And yeah, that you can kind of see the motion of solutions in that picture. They have to be circles centered at the origin. The middle is the origin here. Going clockwise, just like I told you. By plotting the right-hand sides of the differential equation, the system, using vector plot, I can see solutions have to follow those arrows. They have to be circles centered at the origin going clockwise. By the way, even though you can think about this purely mathematically, you can also relate this to the original physical model with the back and forth motion. It's, this is not implying that the mass moves in a circle. It's not implying that. All this picture is doing, this phase plane, All it's doing is keeping track of the values of X and V over time. If you think about this particular one, that's the outer circle, starting at the point X is one, Y is uh, V is zero, when time is zero, that's corresponding to pulling the mass one meter to the right, letting it go from rest. What happens? After a small amount of time has elapsed, X has become smaller, the mass has moved to the left, and V has become negative, the mass is moving to the left. When you reach this point down here where V is minimized and X is at zero, that's when you are passing through the equilibrium position with a velocity that is maximized in absolute value. You are moving as fast as possible to the left at that instant in time. When you're over here, X is now negative, you are to the left of the equilibrium position. V is negative, you're still moving to the left, but it's getting closer to zero. It's slowing down. When you reach this point, that's where the spring is scrunched as much as possible. At that instant in time, V is zero, the mass is turning around. X is negative, it's most negative in fact there. But now you're up here, the velocities become positive, the mass is moving to the right. 
while x is still negative. Here you're passing through the equilibrium position again at x equals zero, and the velocity is maximized in a positive direction. Now x is positive, but you're slowing down. And once you get to about 6.28 seconds, you are back to where you started with essentially zero velocity. If I combine that graph with a graph of cosine comma negative sine with parametric plot, <clears throat> I can see that circle in there. That's a solution curve. You have to imagine it going clockwise though. The motion along it is clockwise. Here I can use manipulate to animate the actual motion along the curve. Here is my solution curve like I graphed with the calculator moving over time. I could add position and velocity vectors to this picture if I wanted to. I'm not going to take the time to do so, but I could. At any moment in time, the position vector would go from, let me get rid of the frame and add axes here. At any moment in time, say right here, the position vector will go from the origin to that point. And the velocity vector will be tangent to the curve pointing in the direction of motion. It'll be parallel to the arrows that you see in this vector field. Though those arrows that you see are actually not quite long enough because if you make them the appropriate length, they get too long and the picture gets too messy. So Mathematica is scaling those vectors down. How do you make those arrows? How do you know where, how to draw them? Essentially at any point X comma V, you are drawing a vector with these components. That's how you make it. So at any point X comma V, say right here, for example, if you draw an arrow whose first component is V and whose second component is negative X, it might look like this. V I hat minus X J hat. That's a vector in the vector field. And any any time a solution passes through that point right there, that's got to be a velocity vector for the solution. And the solution would keep going like this. But that would be a velocity vector for the solution at that moment in time. Got to use your imaginations with this, right? You got you to be able to think clearly about the, every single word that I'm saying. I know it's so hard to pay attention in math class. I know time goes by so slow, but it really does come, come down to thinking clearly about exactly what I'm saying and learning how to think this way. In our last 14 minutes, let's go back to the predator prey model with the worms and rabbits and think about the vector field. And the null clines again. The equations we had were dw dt equals w minus w times r, and dr dt is negative r plus w times r. It's a predator prey model. The fact that it's a predator prey model is not because I'm using w and r for worms and robins. Those could represent other species. The things that make it a predator prey model are the signs of these W times R terms. Minus sign there, plus sign there. When W and R are both positive, you've got worms and robins. The fact that there is a minus sign there means their interactions are contributing negatively to the growth rate of the worms because the robins are eating the worms. On the flip side, the fact that this is positive W times R means interactions between worms and robins have a positive effect on the rate of change of the robins because the robins are eating the worms. That's what makes it a predator prey model. And on Monday, we saw that you want to find the null clines by factoring.
setting these things equal to zero and graphing the corresponding lines in this case in the phase plane showing you where dy dw dt is zero and dr dt is zero i don't want to re-go through all that what would it look like in mathematica here is the code for the vector field itself that is the vector field those two functions you see inside of the curly braces separated by a comma are the right hand sides of this differential system of differential equations w minus w times r and negative r plus w times r just like before that's what gets put into vector plot and what happens when we enter this what does the picture look like Notice I'm also, my window W is going from negative 0.1 to 3, and R is going from negative 1.1 to 3. <clears throat> We're mostly looking at the first quadrant, and here's what the picture looks like. And I don't know how well you rem remember Monday's class, but this should look good. Um, we did draw in null clines. The W no line was the R axis where W is zero and also a horizontal line at R equals one. Notice these arrows are very close to vertical when R is one, like they look exactly vertical over here and they're close to vertical over here. And the R no lines included the W axis and notice these arrows are horizontal close to the W axis. And W equals one, a vertical line right here. And all the arrows close to this vertical line right about here are close to being horizontal. And we drew in curves that look like circles centered at the point one one, representing periodic solutions, telling you that the worm and robin populations are gonna oscillate in a periodic way. Remember, that's not necessarily accurate. It's an oversimplification of reality. I like to think of it as telling you it could possibly happen. It's possible that the worm and robin population could oscillate periodic, periodically. If not exactly periodic, maybe approximately periodic. Up and down and up and down and up and down. Maybe not exact periodicity, but approximate periodicity. Turns out, I told you this, it's impossible to solve the system of differential equations, except for certain initial conditions on the axes, actually. It's impossible to find formulas. They're not separable. You can't do any separation of variables here. For one thing, the right-hand sides depend on both dependent variables, both W and R. That makes it harder. And also these nonlinearities, W times R, make it harder. However, there's no problem in still making this vector field and no problem in still seeing solutions look like they're probably periodic. If you want to be more confident that they're periodic, the way to do that in Mathematica is with something called stream plot. I'm plugging in the same vector field here, but now I have the word stream here instead of vector. I enter this, I'm also combining it with the vector field, which is the plot you see above. Here's the picture that I get. And these red curves that you see that have arrows on top of them, those are solution curves. And they look pretty circ circular near 1, 1. But as you get further and further away from 1, 1, they get less and less circular. Until when you're down here, say, it's a pretty strange looking kind of oddly shaped oval. There are some subtleties here that I haven't mentioned. One subtlety is that the speed of the solution curve as time changes does not stay constant. It actually does stay constant with the mass on a spring phase plane with these circles the solutions are traversed at a constant speed. But here they're not. 
what happens? The curve more slowly the closer you are to the origin. So if you if you were able to animate it, you'd see motion that's pretty slow near the origin, and is pretty fast when you're further away from the origin. Here, here the R and uh, the W and R populations are changing very slowly. Here they're changing pretty rapidly when they're large. It'd be a pretty fast motion up here, and then it slows down as it approaches here. Does that make sense? I think maybe some sense. Does it confirm with reality? I'm sure not perfectly. But you might wonder whether it confirms conforms with reality approximately. I think that's about all I have to say. There's lots of things going on here that we, we just don't have the time to emphasize. I probably will, if I can find a solution key, assign a few more problems and you can just check my answer key. You do, you do not need to turn anything else in. The only thing left to do for credit is the final exam. I should say the final exam is the end. Don't ask to do any extra credit after the final exam is over. Okay. The way you're going to do better in the course is just doing better in the final anyway. All right. We'll end early today. Have a good day.